morning. We are going to have a wonderful conversation, and we're going to learn a lot of things today uh, when it comes to uh, artificial intelligence. This is a conversation about disruptive thinking. It is one of the pillars of what Bishop Jakes' foundation is all about, and hopefully educate us on the future and what is coming up for us in the next 10 to 20 years when it comes to artificial intelligence and how we all play a role. I just want to give you a quick background on the T.D. Jakes Foundation, though. It has a bold vision for transforming underdeserved communities through education, workforce development, and economic empowerment. The foundation envisions a world where every individual, regardless of their background, has equal access to opportunities. What do we need to learn about AI? What about our kids? How do we fit into the curriculum? What happens next? We don't want to get left behind. So Bishop has assembled an incredible panel here today to talk about those solutions and those answers. AI has the possibility to change the landscape of how we do business and propel us forward. But research shows that only 13.8% of authors leading AI conferences are women and only 3.8% are black. We are hoping that these discussions will help change that. So, without further ado, let's meet our panelist. We are going to start off with Dr. Michael Sorrell. He is the longest serving president in the 151 year history of Paul Quinn College. During his 16 year leadership, the college has become nationally known for reimagining higher education to better serve today's students. Graduation rates have improved by more than 30%. He's helped reduce the student loan debt by $30,000 and won countless and countless and countless of awards. I literally had pages of accolades. Uh, Dr. Sorrell is one of the most celebrated college presidents in America, named one of the world's 50 greatest leaders by Fortune magazine. He's distinguished in his career, and we are honored to have him here today. So let's give him a big round of applause. <laughs> Lynn McBee, she has been a volunteer leader for more than 29 years, worked more than 45,000, 45,000, get that, hours of service for more than 30 nonprofits. She has tackled tough issues like improving education, serving the homeless, protecting children, fighting domestic violence. She has served more than nine years as CEO of Young Women's Preparatory Network, a public and private partnership that creates STEM-focused schools of choice in all-girls settings. The graduates of the YWPN have a 100% college acceptance rate. Isn't that incredible? That's really incredible. That's a true testament of what you're doing. In, 1920, in 2022, Lynn was appointed Dallas Workforce Development Czar. Welcome her, please, with a big round of applause. And of course, the man that really needs no introduction, our very own Bishop T.D. Jakes. We have to stand up, yes. Of course, he is the chairman and founder of T.D. Jakes Foundation working close to bridge the digital divide. He has helped build homes and has all sorts of initiatives. And of course, my pastor, I've actually been at the Potter's house now for, gosh, going on at least close to two decades probably now. And uh, we really appreciate you bringing us all together, Bishop. So I I've really covered a lot of what you've done over the years. And one of the things that you are, that was really important to you is technology, STEM education, getting our kids prepared for the future. Why is that so important to you? I think it's important to me in part because I grew up uh, during the industrial age. I've seen these types of paradigm shifts before and I've seen how we fall through the cracks. When you see that the projections for uh, people of color uh, by around 2040, 2045 is pretty, pretty bleak if we don't make this transition very quickly. I think it's gonna take more than our school systems, it's gonna take all hands on deck to penetrate the culture and the community and bring awareness to them, what they need to be taking in college, what they need to be thinking about in life, what jobs are gonna remain, what jobs are not gonna remain. When you look at uh, the World Economic Summit suggests that technology is going to wipe out about 85 million jobs. 
and uh, it's going to replace it with about 95 uh, million jobs, about 97 million jobs. But those jobs require certain skill sets in order to be able to do that. Those who are not ready get left behind. And the tragedy of them being left behind is that their whole family is left with them. So we want to be as proactive as we can be to bring about the change we're trying to do. Let's talk about that. What can be done? Let's start with you, Dr. Sorrell, about what can be done to prepare our students. Because it is, AI can be exhilarating, but it can also be petrifying. And I think some people might be intimidated by that. What are you doing to get these kids ready? No, thank you for the question. And let me first just say how important it is that we're having this conversation and that this is a wonderful place to have it. Um, it is important if we're going to make sure the AI is as accessible as possible that all of us play a role in that. Our churches, our schools, our community organizations, everyone has a role to play in ensuring that this is brought about in the most equitable way possible. Now that being said, um, the, the uncomfortable truth of the matter is those communities that have been left behind traditionally are at risk and being so far left behind with this that it is terrifying. McKinsey did a report years ago that talked about all the new jobs that were going to be created. What they didn't focus on, because it wasn't the point of that report, was that this is akin to building a house on top of a foundation that wasn't adequately built in the first place. So if you are in an underperforming school and you are underperforming in that institution, imagine, let's just use math for example. Let's say that you took basic algebra and you were a C student in basic algebra. The next course that you were assigned to was advanced math or advanced calculus. If you had a C in basic algebra, you're going to fail advanced calculus. So what institutions like mine are working on today is how do we ensure that everyone can succeed? So what we do is we have a series of certificate programs. We have four pillars of a Paul Quinn education. The first is what you major in. The second is the work program. If you come to Paul Quinn, everyone gets a job. The third is our certificate program, which every year you get a short-term industry-recognized credential. And it's set up to be able to be done in six weeks at a very reasonable cost so that you don't have to take out loans. And we stack them. So you are given the foundation, regardless of whatever you do academically, and this is for adult learners as well, but you're given a foundation and a pathway which says this is how you get to where you need to be. Those are the types of things we need to do to ensure that the AI aspect of this doesn't leave far too many vulnerable people completely without hope or realistic possibilities. Lynn, let's talk about that, about the adult learner. Somebody that's already out there, maybe they have a job just to sustain, but they don't have that college degree. What opportunities are out there for them so that they don't get left behind as well? Because it is important that we continue education. I think all of us are going to have to continue to learn about AI. We can't stop or we're going to get left behind. What is out there for that person who may already be in the workforce, doesn't have the college degree, how can they afford to learn yeah, what we I, need to learn? I think first I wanna, wanna say what Michael said is exactly right. The foundation that you are given when you start. And so I'm real excited that DSD is doing some early college and they're doing a lot of career institutes and things that really give people credentials and certificates to really get a job. It's like a hard handoff. It's like I graduate from school, but all these programs are brand new. The Dallas County Promise, six years old. So if you're in um, one of the five zip codes in our county that we've got three generations of poverty, you've never been given these opportunities. And so now we have 40% of folks in Dallas County that are low income. And so you ask, how does that adult, that working poor, that mom that has two jobs that is just, you know, barely sustaining, what do we do? So Workforce Dallas was grown out of that specifically to address the working poor. And so the good news is that we've got a wonderful hiring mixture today and we've got people that will hire people on the spot. 
and a lot of these jobs are six-week certificates. There's a lot of apprenticeships now, but I think, you know, the good news is, is the big institutions are finally starting to line up and make the investments in the places because without the big institutions, you're not going to have system change. And we really have to have system change. This is not something where we're going to go in and we're going to work on it for 10 years and it's going to be fixed. These are genera three generations. You're talking about folks in a family that have never seen anyone in their family go to work. And so it becomes a behavioral mindset. And so I think for that adult uh, that adult that is out there that's the working poor, there's a lot of opportunities here today, but I would say, I would love for you to you know, hook up with Workforce Dallas, because we are, in t this is what it was set up for, to really look at the adult worker, the 25 to 64 year old that didn't have the opportunities that are be being created today, that are working multiple jobs, really analyzing what is your, what, what, what can you do? What do you, you know, because you've probably done a lot of different things and there's probably some things that we can, you know, real quickly um, give you a certificate in and put you to work. So I'm excited about the big institutions starting to line up and really focus on where they need to focus. The, the unfortunate thing is 40% of Dallas, you think about that, Dallas has 1.3 million people. That's a lot of people that are the working, it's, it's too many. So, um, you know, AI is the future, but there are so many, if you can be a phlebotomist, if you can uh, be a patient care technician, if you can uh, do in transportation logistics, if you can do mechanics, onboarding, you know, all, there are so many jobs for people that, that and they do want to work. They just have not had access to the opportunity. So, Bishop, I know you preach a lot about this, about those generational curses, and what role do you and your foundation play in all of this? That's a very interesting uh, question. First of all, T.D. Jakes Foundation uh, seeks to provide solutions to sociological problems by convening things like this where we can have formats to discuss them and also taking advantage of the 30 million people that we connect with on social media to be a voice of advocacy to connect supply with demand. So what we're trying to do is to convene these types of atmospheres through our facilities, uh, through our ability to reach globally our audience, and then to aggregate the content creation that comes from these dialogues and put them out there on YouTube and put them in other places for other people to begin to think differently. I think what we're trying to do through the foundation is not only STEM and STEAM programs, but pathways to job readiness. We're also trying to increase awareness so that this is injected into the, uh, into, the, into the culture, into our family life, into our conversation around the table, how we talk to our children, what we think is important. Many times our parents are so busy trying to make a living that they don't have a life and they're not aware of what is going on outside of paying the rent and dropping the kids off to school and trying to keep up with the price of buttermilk, you know? Uh, and they find themselves in these horrendous situations where there's a disconnect between the child's world and the adult world. So this exposes through our culture, through our community, uh, through our city in general. And, and let me hasten to add that Dallas has become a huge hub for Fortune 100 companies who are very interested in technology. The job opportunities are absolutely amazing. It's not the opportunities that we're worried about, it's the job readiness. How, what do you think cities, city leaders and civic leaders need to do to prepare us for what's coming in the next decade or so when it comes to artificial intelligence and technology? Dr. Sorrell. Feel as if that could have been a loaded question. Um, no, the the first thing is we have to understand it. We have to understand how truly disruptive it will be. And the way I like to explain it to everyone is this: How many people here remember life before Google? Mm -hmm. All right. <laughs> Do you remember what it was like to just have a question that you wanted answered? and you had to actually go research it? World Book Encyclopedia. World Book, right. 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 I'm and too young, I can't remember. Right here. <laughs> <laughs> we literally can't imagine or remember because it was, it's become that much a part. That's artificial intelligence. 
right? I mean, you have a feed that gets populated when you go to your Google app. And so when you think about it in that light, now just imagine it being applied to everything. And you begin to understand what we are dealing with. And so the job of those of us who are in positions of trust, where people who are vulnerable are depending upon us to be advocates for them, is to really understand the magnitude of the lift. We literally have to be obsessed with making sure we understand it, we understand how it will be applied well enough so that we can support others who are gonna need to be able to function in a world with that when they haven't truly been able to function effectively in this world. So it's, it's a lot. If I want a piece of this pie, and I wanted to look for where to start, what types of jobs, what types of education, where do I begin? Because a lot of people don't know where to even start when it comes to looking at this and looking at the future. I mean, I think it depends on your age, right, where you are. I mean, I think a good, you know, the public education system, again, in high school is, you know, they're focusing on this, on how do we, you know, prepare people for these future careers. I think, you know, Dallas College has a lot of offerings in, um, you know, in certificate programs. I think every company has, you know, thinking about what, what, what are they going to do AI-wise, and they've got their own training programs. So I think, you know, Dallas College, DSD, um, Paul Quinn companies. College. Paul Quinn College. Paul Quinn of college. course, I'm going to let you pump your own college. I'm going to let you, yeah, I'm going to let you talk about your. I can't just have you do a commercial and not That's include right. us yeah. in the commercial, right? <laughs> well, I want you to talk about your own stuff. I mean, I, Dallas College and DSD, I know much, you know Paul Quinn. So um, I would say look at those resources. But within companies, they all have got programs. I mean, every company has got a training program. And if they don't, they're partnering with a, you know, institution. They're partnering with someone. So I think, you know, and then there's. There's online training programs. We were talking about this backstage, that um, institution of higher learning that you wouldn't n normally think about having online. MIT has got online different things. And so I will say, though, we've got great local resources here. I don't know that you need to look for, but there's, you know, I mean, you can probably Google it and find out where to, where to go for these, so. I think we have to back up a little bit. Because your question says, if I were to want to do something about this, where would I go to find the information? I think we have to go back a step further and deal with the want to. Um, being smart has not been marketed to our community. Being brilliant, being astute has not been marketed to our young people in the way that it really ought to be marketed. Uh, what has been marketed is music, hip hop, uh, sports, and those things that have been marketed to us, we have done well in. Those things where the floor is flat and the rules are clear, we excel. The basketball, the floor is flat, the rules are clear, we excel. Football, the floor is flat, the rules are clear, we excel. When it comes to technology, the floor is not flat. We're 3.8% of the, of the technological people who are really invested in AI. It has not been additionally, there's no place to see it, there's no place to watch it. We have not made it sexy to see. We have not made it desirable. So I think we have to start at the marketing of the opportunity in order to get people engaged to the point that they want to. Once they want to, then these solutions become apparent. And quite frankly, when students have a demand, colleges adjust curriculum. But if there's no demand for the courses being offered, nobody can maintain a course where there's no demand for it. So we have to go back to the thirst. If the thirst is not, if they don't see it on TV, they don't hear it in music, they don't hear it in the house. And the truth of the matter is, uh, I think it's something like 40% of African-American homes and uh, Hispanic homes uh, don't have uh, high definition technology that would allow them to even experiment with it. So it, it really doesn't exist to them. And then when they go out to the job force and they're unable to compete, then crime, anger, frustration, disappointment opens the door. And I think we have to start with creating an appetite for this and advertising it. That's why we do STEAM, because the stats suggest that the arts are a good gateway 
to get people involved into to production, uh, film development, music, that sort of thing. It's a good gateway to get them connected with what algorithms mean and what they do and how they work. And then from there, they can channel into perhaps other aspects and other opportunities and ventricles through which they, right now, the only thing that's advertised is the stage. So we think of being on the stage rather than owning the stage. When people are intimidated by this, because there are people that are concerned about AI and the humanity and the empathy that some jobs require, that some jobs might be replaced by you know, computer or you know, artificial intelligence. How do we, I guess, quell that fear uh, that people might have that are concerned about this technology that maybe don't want to have anything to do with it? Where do we begin with that? Well, first of all, we tell them the truth. There are a bunch of jobs that are absolutely going to go away. And 30 percent are going to be displaced by automation in yeah. the next like, five years. Yeah, 30 percent. And the 30 percent that are going to be replaced are the people who are the least skilled, right? Or the majority of the 30%, right? So we now have a responsibility of addressing the skills deficit. And, you know, I tell my college president friends this all the time. You have a responsibility of expanding how you deliver education. It simply cannot be we're just going to make sure they get four-year degrees. One of the reasons why we added certificate programs is because you have to meet people where they are. And you have to create pathways where people can reskill and upskill continuously. Everyone in the liberal arts community, people talk about being lifelong learners. And I always laugh about that. I think it's great to be a lifelong learner. I think it is way better to be a lifelong earner. And so we as institutions have to create on and off ramps that are seamless, that are inexpensive, that allow people to skill themselves into a different economic place easily without spending the next 100 years of their families' lives repaying student loans. So we have to reimagine education. Ben, you had something. Yeah, I do. I think, and I think corporations are thinking that too. I'm gonna, I'm gonna give a shout out to Parkland uh, Health and Hospital System, who is an awesome partner. And I will tell you, in terms of upskilling. So if you come in with like what's phlebotomy or patient care technician, one of those things, they have a chart that says if I do another like eight week certificate program, I'm going to move up. And so it's really, I mean, they're so intentional, and they're also intentional about hiring people that represent who they actually take care of. So it's, it's beautiful. They're great partners. But I think all corporations are looking at how do I retain my talent because it is so competitive right now in terms of getting good workers. I mean, people, the gig economy is huge. People want to drive Uber. They want to, you know, do some Starbucks for their health and they want to shop, you know, do the online shopping thing. And so you've got that big gig economy that's taking a lot of people out. And so if you can get someone that is trained, that is ready to go, they want to hold on to those workers. And so there's a lot of companies that have real solid upskilling programs. But what Michael said is exactly right. We have got to give certificates and credentials that lead to a job. It cannot be a, you got your four degree, you got your two degree, let's go. It has to be a hard handoff because the time that someone has between graduating from high school or that two year, in six months they can fall into all kinds of things, and you know that with, with the beat that you cover, and that's what happens. And so hard hands off, certificates, credentials, getting in with companies that have upskilling programs, and I will tell you that they're, they're doing that. They're upskilling folks these days, and so it's, it's, yeah, I mean, the opportunity's there, but it, we've just got to be, like you said, intentional about it, and companies want to hold on to their employees now when they're good workers, so. You know, you, I, I just want to, to inject this little thought. Uh, the word that she just used, I thought, was very important, intentional. The erosion of diversity, equity, and inclusion, which continues to erode in our society, especially since the Supreme Court affirmative action decision, immediately the next day, DEI people started getting fired. The problem with that is the stats show that not only is it the right thing to do, the moral thing to do, but it also is a more profitable thing to do. Companies that engage in diversity have a 20 to 30% increase in profit margins. 
but we must be intentional about it on all fronts, from employers to employees to families to educational institutions. It is naive to think that we will organically see the infusion of all people represented in the workforce just by prayer. We're going to have to be intentional. We're going to have to be, uh, we're going to have to go after it. We're going to have to make it a priority. And we're going to have to get unusual uh, disruptive alliances, like what you see on the stage is a disruptive alliance. These disruptive alliances and connections between organizations that traditionally may not work together, not opposed to each other, just wouldn't organically work together, are the key to bringing about change. It's going to take disruptive thinking to solve the problem because the projection is that 30% that she's talking about is 85 million people, which is about a third of the population here in the U.S. is going to fall into the abyss of poverty, the abyss of unemployment. The projections are clear. And COVID, if anything, hastened it because it brought us into deeper technology more quickly and more rapidly. And so that's a very frightening thought. I think we have to be proactive while we're working for, at one job. We've got to be trying to get a certificate in the next job <laughs> so that we can go to Paul Quinn, okay, or it's, <laughs> and, and, and get a certificate so that when the bell rings and, and your job has been liquidated, imagine if you were a telephone repairman and you spent all your life doing telephone repair, fixing phone booths. Would you have a job today? Absolutely not. Those jobs are all gone. Lots and lots of those jobs are gone. Uh, manufacturing jobs are gone in this country. A lot of industrial jobs are gone in this country. And a lot of the people who are angry in this country right now about economic inequities are the offspring of the last change we went through. And they lost their job at Pittsburgh Steel and Union Carbide and all of that. And they haven't been upwardly mobile since. This is about to happen again. So if we don't learn from what we went through the first time, we're gonna be ill-prepared for the second one. Can I, can I add something? It is a fallacy for anyone to believe that conversations about expanding your skill set don't take place at the upper echelon of companies, law firms, and things of that nature. When I was a baby lawyer in the mid-1990s, one of the partners pulled me aside and said, you must be obsessive about learning new practice areas and learning new skills because business happens in cycles. And the, I was a corporate securities lawyer. I did mergers and acquisitions. And she said, there are periods where there aren't very many mergers and acquisitions. There are bankruptcies. And you've got to figure out a way to ensure that you are always profitable. They had that conversation with me at 27 years old. I never forgot it. So what Bishop is describing, what Lynn is describing, is simply the extension of those real world conversations to everyone up and down the socioeconomic status classes. That is what we are talking about. When we talk about jobs going away, there are jobs that are gonna be created, millions by AI. So what types of jobs, if I'm sitting out there, what should I be looking for? What, what's the, what are the sexy jobs that are going to be created, I guess, by, by AI? I don't know if I can talk about the sexy jobs from AI, but the jobs right now, if you want a job in healthcare, transportation logistics, IT, construction trades, those are where the jobs are. I mean, we're going to be building a lot of things, and I think AI just lets us do all these things faster. I'm not an expert on AI, but I will tell you, in every single one of those industry verticals, there are so many jobs. We're going to be building so many things, the convention center, the fair park, everything. So we need, you know, people in, in trades, transportation, logistics, all of that's moving faster. Um, you know, healthcare we've talked about, and everything's going to be sped up by AI, but those are places you can get solid jobs and you can really work to upskill, so. But you have to have a foundational knowledge in technology. Yeah. All right, so we used to have the trades in schools. Mm -hmm. And if we had the trades in schools now, students would be learning computers. 
if you take your car to the mechanics, they're using computers. Everyone's using computers. So we have to make sure that all of our students are comfortable with the digital currency. And that's more than TikTok. That's more than Snapchat. It's more than social media. It's understanding foundationally how you get to the point where social media is being utilized. We have to have a foundational understanding of the digital currency. One, one thing that, that, that I want to piggyback off of that and say that's really important. <clears throat> At the core of the problem, we are consumers. We consume technology. The latest gadgets that come out, we buy them. We buy them all the time. We are a consumer, is a consumeristic society. America in general, African Americans specifically, we are we are taught to consume technology. We have nothing against it. Now you can get your blood pressure taken. You can get your blood sugar regulated through the, because of technology. Those are all great things. We buy them. We don't make them. We don't fix them. We don't market them, we don't produce them. We got to, we've got to figure out the core principle of be fruitful. What do you produce, not what do you buy? Because when you get down to produce, that's gonna create the thirst that says, how does this work? How, how, how does this work? How does this work? Those types of questions where we become curious about making things rather than buying things is going to change our appetite for what we pursue as careers and change our appetite with, it's not how much you know, it's what you ask. Everybody's using it, but only a few people are thinking about making it or fixing it. It's kind of like the Industrial Revolution back in the day and how the steam engine changed everything. This is revolutionizing literally everything. I'm, I'm, I think I, I read somewhere or I heard somewhere that it was estimated trillions of dollars worth of economic impact over the next few years when it comes to artificial intelligence. So I'm getting a wrap here, but how, what are your last words? What's your last advice when it comes to this issue? And how we can succeed, how we don't get left behind, how we can all collaborate. Yeah, I want to, um, the, the, the bishop's point about becoming producers of things, we all have to develop an entrepreneurial mindset, right? We have to be entrepreneurial in our thoughts and entrepreneurial in our action. Because at its core, I view AI as the ultimate entrepreneur. It is constantly looking for ways to improve what's around us. We have to develop that mindset as well. And it doesn't mean that we have to start with the most complicated thing. It can be the simplest thing. But we have to understand that the days of us going to school, getting a degree, which by the way, you need to do. Life is fundamentally better when you have a degree, right? On all fronts, the data is very clear on that. But we have to let go of this idea that once we get that one degree, we're done. We're not done. The pace of change is just too rapid. We have to continuously be in growth mode. So we're going to have to encourage through our school systems that our students understand that they are continuously going to be in learning mode and growth mode so they can continuously be in earning mode. I read a, a stat the other day, and it said a child that's graduated from high school right now will have 23 different jobs in their lifetime. And back when I was graduating, if you had 23 different jobs, you, there was something wrong with you. You couldn't keep a job, right? It was like, we can't hire that person. But I think, to, you know, to your point, it's, it's building up your, your resume, whatever that is, whatever credential it is, whatever certificate it is, but it's also building up the behavioral pieces and are you a good speaker? And do you have the right workplace etiquette? And all of those, so it's your whole thing. And, and then to continue to just, you know, beat the drum about upskilling yourself or looking for that next opportunity. Like you said, you've got to be your own entrepreneur on your path. And I think you've got to, you know, say yes and explore all those opportunities that come because if you're going to have 23 different jobs in your lifetime, you're not saying no a lot. Your mind is open and you're moving forward and you're saying yes to upskilling and you're saying yes to getting a new skill. And so just, you know, build up your, build up your resume, build up your credential certificates, your, yourself and say yes to the opportunities that are gonna come your way. The other thing, my final thought is, 
Technology, because it is predominantly created by white males, does not recognize uh, simple things like uh, a soap dispenser recognizing a brown hand or face recognition with, with the phone. It's 100 times less likely to recognize if it is a non-white person uh, using the artifact, okay? So what we need, it's rather than to fix and refix and refix, is we need representation. Our, our workforce needs to look like our country. It needs to look like our, our leadership needs to look like our country. Our, our schools need to look like our country, creating that kind of diversity so that as technology takes over, it is programmed to understand that we're not just all white, young, young millennial or lower males, which is largely who has led the way. And that's great that they led the way, but they are not a full picture of all of America. So we need women represented. We need brown people and black people represented so that as AI is artificial intelligence, it has to be programmed in. If it doesn't see us, it doesn't see us. Wow, that's, that is such a great point, Bishop. And I think if we get involved now, if we get our education now, five years from now, 10 years from now, I believe in a couple years from now, we're way further ahead than everybody else. So we need to get on the ball like right now. Go and, and do your thing and go to Paul Quinn go College. To, Paul Quinn and go to, <laughs> go to, go to Paul Quinn College. And get, do what now? Go to the hiring mixer that's out here. Oh, yeah, look. Got it's lots of companies. Yep, lots of opportunities for jobs. Thank you so much to all our panelists. Please give them a round of applause. I, it's Yeah, they deserve a big standing ovation because this is a big think tank that we have here. Thank you so much, and I think we have some announcements now, and uh, I wish we'd had time for questions, because I'm sure you have a thousand questions, but I think this is a great conversation. Bishop, thank you so much for bringing us together and always leading the way and leading the way. <laughs> I'm glad to do it. I'm excited about it. Great things are going to come out of it. Great things are going to come out of today. I'm proud to be a part of the foundation. A lot of people are going to get jobs today. When people get jobs, children get fed, they're more alert in school, crime goes down, the city becomes more livable. This is a great thing. 